Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 18th. This first one was sent by my friend, was sent to me by my friend Navy Thomas, a scientist in Poland working on liquid body armor report says. This is from foxnews.com. I'll just read the first part of the article here. Scientists in Poland are working on body armor technology that uses specially designed liquid to protect against bullets, according to Reuters. Unlike Newtonian liquids such as water, the sheer thickening fluid hardens on impact from a projectile, offering protection from bullets. The technology has already been touted as a potential replacement for Kevlar and body armor. The exact composition of the fluid is known only to Poland's Institute of Security Technologies, known as Moratex, and the inventors at the Military Institute of Armored Technology in Warsaw. This has been going around a lot of the social networks as something really new and innovative, but to tell the truth, our government itself has been working on this for the past four years, and if you look at the click link to the article on popular science, that is a link going back to 2010 besides. Uh, so uh, by no means is this something that's just been uh, come out of the blue and uh, something absolutely and completely new. I'll, I'll give the links to both of them. I'll give the links to that one, and then I'll give, as usual, all the links are down below, but I'll also include the link to the Popular Science article from July 9th, 2010. So this is something that uh, we're not behind the curve on this one at all. And if you have any training in physics whatsoever or took physics classes to where you had a, maybe a, a fun type of teacher that let you work with different uh, cool kind of stuff, you've probably mixed together cornstarch and water. Well, basically by mixing cornstarch and water together until it makes a pretty thick liquid, you've made one of those shear resistant liquids yourself. And you'll notice that the thicker it gets, the more you, uh, if you stir it slowly, it stirs fine. But then when you try to stir it quicker, it really resists extremely hard. And then if you get it really nice and thick, the, the trick to do is to put it into a thick plastic bag like one of those oven cooking bags that won't break easily and seal it all up. And then you can poke it with your finger and it'll move out of, the, out of the side just like, you know, water basically. But then you go to punch it and it feels like you're punching into a block of clay. It'll give just a tiny bit, but it won't give much more. And then you go back and poke it again and it moves to the side um, real easy. So. This is something that's been around for decades as far as these uh, shear thickening fluids. So this is nothing new. It's just that I think it may be very possible that Poland has just come up with the next generation of it if you consider cornstarch as first generation and then what they're working on um, as second generation. Maybe they've uh, got some kind of breakthrough to make it third generation to make it work even a little bit better. But uh, right now the techniques are uh, pretty much well known all over the place as far as uh, there's, there's nothing new under the sun as far as that physics is not uh, aware of as far as these sheer thickening fluids. But I thought it was kind of cool. And also, uh, I did a report, I think it was about two years ago, with the help of Navy Thomas Aid about the uh, armor, the body armor for motorcycles called D3O body armor. And it's kind of the same thing. These, these sheer thickening liquids are anywhere from liquids similar to water all the way to, some people call them custard, but they can even be... Uh, thick like clay really to where they just barely move so the thickness of them just depends on the application and you've been able to for years you've been able to buy body armor it's called D3O body armor and I'll put that link up too and what it does too is it feels soft like foam it even has kind of like a clay kind of feel to it too it feels like halfway between clay and and foam but then if you hit it with a baseball bat the stuff hardly moves at all but then you poke it with your finger and it's squishy like foam and this guy demonstrates he hits somebody in the arm with a frying pan that's using uh, that's wearing this uh, D3O body armor, and it shows how it resists the impact real easy and protects the the person, and it makes it more comfortable to wear. That's the main thing with any kind of body armor is you want it to be comfortable and soft and flexible to wear. But then as soon as somebody's shooting at you, you want it to be almost as hard as steel. So, you know, this is something that. Uh, I think we're ready for third generation on this too, so maybe we will see some breakthroughs as soon as some more information is revealed. And next up, this is from ESO.org. This is from my friend Robert Bangalore Babel 
for signs of self-interacting dark matter. Dark matter may not be completely dark after all. What they were doing with this is they were using um, some uh, astronomical, well, I'll just read the thing here, using the MUSE instrument at, at on ESO's VLT in Chile, which is just another word for a real powerful telescope, along with some images from Hubble, a team of astronomers studied the sim simultaneous collision of four galaxies in the galaxy cluster Abel 3827. The team could trace out where the mass lies within the system and compares the distribution of dark matter with the positions of the luminous galaxies. And what they actually did is one of the galaxies appears to be um, traveling a little bit faster than its dark matter. In fact, the dark matter seems to be lagging behind. They can tell by taking different positions and speeds and guesstimating, I guess, the uh, gravitational pull of the different parts of the galaxy. They've uh, concluded that the dark matter interacts in a way other than gravity. They know dark matter produces extra gravity. The basic idea behind dark matter is our galaxy, like the Milky Way, has a certain amount of matter that we know exists because we can see it, but it's not enough to keep the, the gravitational pull enough to keep us together. So there's some other way we're holding together as a galaxy, and so what they're doing is they're calling that dark matter. It's just an extra something that we don't know exactly what it is that holds the galaxy together so we don't fly apart, which would take place based on at least what we know. So basically with this is, uh, the idea of this is if they can find an interaction of dark matter that's other than gravitational with itself that's causing it to lag, some kind of, I don't know what you would call it, maybe a repulsive, maybe an attractive effect, uh, maybe an electromagnetic effect. If they could take educated guesses now that they've got the a uh, large hadron collider up and running at some higher voltages and higher energies, they could probably use some educated guesses and crash some different things together and maybe actually start finding out more than just basically instead of we don't know what dark matter is, we just know the effects, maybe they'll actually start figuring out that we can have some ideas of what dark matter actually is instead of just the effects it has. So. That's the main thing. With detecting dark matter, it's going to be so difficult that if it's nothing but gravitational, that's going to take a long, long time. But if we can figure that dark matter has effects other than just gravitational effects on other things or itself, that gives us a few more possibilities for making experiments where we can actually detect it and figure out a little bit more about what it's actually made from. And this next one, let me see who is it that sent this one in. This is from my friend Harry T., this is Russia's oblique ice breaker, ice breaker Baltica tested in Arctic ice. And this is from gcaptain.com website. This is a little, this is quite interesting too. This is some really new ideas. The, uh, this one firm uh, called Acre Arctic came up with a, an innovative idea. In the future, more ports are going to be opening up farther north, which means more oil tankers are going to be traveling farther up north and the oil tankers are getting bigger too. They're getting bigger and wider. The beams are going to be something like 40 foot across or larger for some of these huge tankers. Well, if you're up in an Arctic region, you're going to have to try to get through the ice. Well, an, an oil tanker is not made to smash through ice. What you need is you need an icebreaker ahead of you smashing the ice. Problem is, if you're in a 40 foot wide oil tanker and your icebreaker ahead of you is only 20, 23 foot wide, it's not making a big enough path for you to be useful. So what you have to do is then you're going to have to pay for two icebreakers to run in front of you. So paying for two of them gets pretty inefficient. And this is a new idea of taking an icebreaker. Um, and they've actually patented it too. Acre Arctic's patented this idea, taking an icebreaker and turning it sideways and using it as a sideways icebreaker. And they also even added to that too. They turn, You could turn it to the other side which is a more flat side instead of a more curved side and make it into an oil scoop. So if you should have an oil spill, it would tend to stay in the ice channel because oil floods to the top. And if you could just turn around the, the propulsion of the ship and have it go the other direction, it could start scooping up any oil spills. So they've got it used for two purposes, which I think is really innovative. And the way it can maneuver so well is it's got three little pods underneath. These propeller pods are being used more and more on large ships so they can move sideways and things like that. So this one's going to have three of these swivel pods in there so it can move back, forth, and side to side either way, turn itself around, whatever. So I think that's a pretty cool idea. I didn't get a chance 
there's a video down below. If you scroll down, there's a video called Icebreaking Emergency and Rescue Vessel Baltica, and they show some of the construction of it, but they don't show any really good views of this hull. And if you look at a typical ship straight on, and you could actually see underwater, it just basically looks like a symmetrical V. But this ship actually, the one side of the V is more or less straight up and down, and the other side is pretty slanted. And I've got a link to the PDF that shows actually front, side, top, and bottom views of this thing. It actually shows you where the little propulsion pods are. So this is quite innovative. I mean, to be able to do this and just end up using one icebreaker ship instead of having to use two of them going ahead on this uh, type of uh, uh, mission to deliver oil tankers across the Arctic is, uh, I think, really, really cool. So if you get a chance to check out, all of the links will be down below. And um, thank you to everybody that's bothered to contribute this week. It's uh, it's great to do the show, and it's a lot easier to do the show when people contribute the material, and that way I know what kind of material you guys really like. And if you happen to be on Facebook, uh, check out our Facebook page, too, under the Dumpster Divers. We have a Facebook page, and it's still very active, a lot of members contributing, and I even get some articles off of our uh, Facebook group page to be able to use in my TDD reports. So until next week, I will catch you then. Take care, everybody.